Confederate factor analysis models can be useful for addressing method variance concerns. However, for using these models effectively, we need to consider identification and also we need to uh, interpret the results properly. In this video, I'll talk about the identification of these models. So the kinds of models that we're talking about are uh, this method variance model. So we have basically indicators that load on the, the, the factors that present the constructs of interest and also a source of method variance. Whether a single source is realistic or not is a question that I'll ask answer in the end of the video but for now well, let's assume that this kind of model is useful. We can have two versions of this model. We can have the one with a method variance that is not measured and then we have another one where the source of method variance is measured. For example social desirability would be measured and then we model social desirability as a cause of the variation in the items or we can have a third option where we have marker indicators. Articles about these models, particularly this method variance unmeasured latent method factor model, note that there are potential identification problems. But these articles don't really go and explain what the identification problem is about. Maybe researchers noted, have noted that when using this model, the software tends to produce warnings or tends to not produce standard errors or other kinds of uh, indications of non-identification but the identification status of these models really has not been addressed well in the literature. So let's take a look at the identification of this kind of model. This is the unmeasured latent method factor model. So we have here in our example model we have three constructs that influence the indicators and then we have a source of method variance and then we estimate this kind of model that uh, uses these latent variables to represent the constructs and this uh, single factor to represent the source of method variance. There's another variant of this model. This is the marker variable model. So we have a, a theoretically unrelated construct that we measure. So construct C here would be the marker variable or marker construct and these would be the marker variables. So the idea with the marker variable was that if we have, have a construct that is assumed to be uncorrelated with the key constructs in the study, the A and B here, then the only reason for correlations between these items of these uh, interesting constructs and the marker construct is because of this shared source of method variance. And we have uh, the measured latent method factor model. This model differs from the marker indicator model in that here we have x7, x8 and x9 would be for example measures of social desirability bias and uh, then the method factor would present social desirability bias as a source of method variation. So it's a directly measured uh, measurement artifact instead of being uh, proxied by a marker variable. So these are method variance indicators. This model is identified and uh, it's identified because it's what Eid and co-authors call bifactor S minus I model. So this is a uh, this is identified and the identification is, is explained in this article. So we don't need to talk about this model in, in, more in detail in this video. So we'll just focus on, on this model with and without these correlations. So if we free these correlations then we, are, we have an unmeasured method factor. If we constrain these correlations to be zero then construct C is a marker construct and this would be a marker variable model. Typically what researchers do is to fix these uh, indicators to be the same to uh, avoid identification problems. These identification problems are commonly not explained in articles that apply this technique. So whenever you have an identification problem you should explain what specifically is not identified in the model instead of just checking that okay I got a warning let's fix all these to once. So all these kind of decisions should be uh, justified instead of just done based on convention and just done to get the, the warning to go away because there are different ways that you can address identification and this is probably not the ideal way at least not for every possible model. So is this identified? This is the least constrained form and uh, so we have the scales are set by fixing the first indicators to uh, load with one and same for the method factor and we are also 
not constraining the method factor indicators. So we could argue that this is identified because it's, it's kind of like an exploratory factor analysis. So it's an exploratory factor analysis with four factors and we uh, have a rotational criterion. So uh, A is rotated to be uncorrelated with the x4 through x9, B is rotated to be uncorrelated with x1, x2 and x3 or, or not uncorrelated but do not have an effect. And then the method factor is rotated to be uncorrelated with any other factors. So we could use this kind of reasoning to, uh, to, to claim that this is actually identified. Whether that reasoning is correct, I don't know. It sounds reasonable, but uh, if someone would, would point, give me that kind of reasoning, I would ask for more evidence. So let's take a look at uh, the identification status of this model from a different perspective. So identification can be proven and uh, here are the covariance equations. I've omitted the variance equations for simplicity because they're just used to solve the error variances. So can we solve all the model parameters from this set of equations assuming that we know all the population covariances? That is the question of identification. We have uh, 36 covariances and uh, we have 15 degrees of freedom because we have 21 different parameters in the model. So is this identified or not? We could start solving this set of equations, but it gets uh, very tedious and uh, it would probably take at least for me several days to uh, figure out whether this is identified or not. And I'm not sure if I would be even able to do it. So uh, but it go, if something uh, goes beyond your skills, then uh, improving identification, then there are other strategies that you can apply. In my video on identification on, on structural equation models of observed variables, I know that there are empirical ways of checking identification. So uh, we're going to be doing this empirical checks strategy for identification to show that this model is identified, but also we'll show that there are, that that's not the full story that there is to the identification of this model. So. Uh, what we do is we first start with empirical strategy. We just estimate the model and uh, I'm going to be using, I will use the uh, whole thing as fine for data in R and I have a uh, visual textual and speed factors each measured with three indicators and then I have an unmeasured method factor on which all the indicators load. We got a warning. So is that indication of non-identification? Well, warning is something that you always need to take seriously. You need to understand what is the source of the warning. And in this case, we need to check at the coefficients. We can see here that uh, the first factor loadings, the x3 converges to, uh, to a very large number. And that indicates that if, if one of the factor loadings starts to converge to a, a very large number, then using that as a, a scaling indicator for the factor might be a good idea. Why it would be a good idea becomes clear when I actually uh, switch the model to be using uh, the indicator number three as the scaling indicator. So what we do is that we free the loading of the first indicator. We set it to NA which is freeing it and then we constrain the loading of the third indicator to be one. And uh, now we estimate there is warning and this is a Haywood case. Okay, so we need to uh, take a look at the, where is the negative variance and how large it is. But generally we got a convergence, we got a chi-square statistic that is uh, close to non-significant, so pretty good. When we look at the actual coefficient estimates, we can see that, that uh, we have standard errors, which is good. So, so we should have standard errors for identified models, not having standard errors or getting a warning is a, a sign of, of non-identifications. There are no extremely large estimates. So all the estimates are, are reasonable. They are, they are in the same ballpark, which is often a good thing to have. And, uh, but these loadings look weird. So uh, the loading of, of X1 is negative and that is the reason why it did not converge initially because we constrained that loading to be positive by constraining it to be one, we are basically saying that the model implied correlation between x1 and x4 uh, should be uh, 
So it's visual and textual correlation is negative. So this implies a positive correlation, but our previous model implied a negative correlation, which didn't fit the data. So uh, when you constrain a factor uh, indicator, a factor loading to be one, that fixes the, the magnitude and also the sign. And the magnitude uh, gives you the, the uh, variance of the latent variable, but the sign can be incorrect. So if we were to fix the x1 to be minus one, then uh, this would converge as well. But now the problem was that our uh, x1 wanted to have a negative sign, we constrained it to be positive and that caused the model to not converge because of misspecification. So these look a bit weird. So if we're saying that x1, x2 and x3 should be loading on uh, on the same factor and then we are seeing that okay x2 does not load at all then and but, but based on existing theory and existing validation of the scale we should expect x1 uh, and x2 both load positively on this factor then uh, this this would be a cause of concern and if I would see this kind of result I would ask the authors to, to address empirical under identification of this problem model because these don't sound like they would be correct or look correct. Then we have the Haywood case. It is small estimate, it's non-significant, so it's possible that the error variance of x3 is simply very small and, and this is just a, a result of sampling error. So this is not something that we need to be concerned about. If the Haywood case was large, so we have a highly significant negative variance, then that indicates model misspecification. Okay, so uh, identification we passed the first check, although we got some weird results, we did not get any, get any errors. Then there are other tests that we can use. So different starting values. Identification basically means that there is, uh, the, the solution to the model is not unique. And what solution we arrive to depends on the starting values. And if we have try multiple different sets of starting values, we get the same estimate for, same for estimates from the model that indicates that the model is probably identical. So we'll start different, we use different starting values. I'm using 0.5 and, and, and 0.5 and 1.5, 0.5, 1.5, just to set something that is uh, reasonably close to one, but has lots of variation. And then we estimate, we get exactly the same results if we uh, take the, uh, the absolute difference it's in the sixth decimal roughly. So we get different starting values give us the same result. This indicates that the model is probably identified. Of course this strategy should be done using multiple different starting values just to be sure that this is not like a local optimum on which the optimizer lands. Then we can do something else. We can estimate using model implied covariance matrix. So we, we estimate here and um, we have the implied covariance matrix from the first model and then we estimate using the implied correlation matrix we take a model summary so we compare the implied estimates from the implied matrix and estimates from the observed matrix we see that they are the same. So they differ in, in the uh, third decimal which is um, not a big deal. One thing where these sets of estimates do differ is model fit. So particularly chi-square here is exactly zero. And the reason is that the implied model fits the data that produces a data that is perfectly consistent with the model. So uh, there is no misfit. So we're basically estimating the same model except that there is no misfit. But these estimates are the same which uh, shows that uh, the estimates should be unique given our covariance matrix. So if you get the same estimates from the implied matrix, then that's an indication that there is identification. Then we use strategy four, estimate using simulated data. So I'm simulating a data set from uh, a set of matrices or a population or I'm actually estimating from a population covariance matrix. I have the lambda matrix of factor loadings I created here. And uh, these loadings are 0, 1.2, 1.4 on uh, all the main interesting factors. And these are from 1 to 1.8 for the method factor. Everything is correlated at 0.3 except the method factor is uncorrelated in, in the psi matrix, which is the factor correlation matrix. 
and uh, then uh, the error, error variances are all ones, all errors are uncorrelated and uh, we get the sigma matrix, the population covariance matrix by multiplying these matrices together and getting adding the error variances. We set the column names and row names and this is our population covariance matrix. Now when we analyze this population covariance matrix we should get uh, the factor loadings 1.0 1, 1.2 and 1.4 and factor correlations of, of 0.3. So let's estimate using uh, <coughs> this uh, sample covariance matrix. So we use the sigma directly the population covariance matrix and we get the correct estimates. So we can recover the correct estimates and that indicates that our estimator is probably consistent and that indicates of course identification. So all good. Did we just uh, prove that the concerns of identification problems that many articles mention are actually not a concern at all? Well, not really. There is the actually more to this, this story. This model is identified, but the identification problems actually concern empirical identification. And uh, so this is identified for, for some values of of the population covariances, but it's not identified for every possible set of values. So that is the problem of empirical under identification. And let's, let's see what happens when we try yet another set of starting values. So I'm using the starting values 1.5, 0.5 again. I'm just using them in a slightly different configuration. We get a warning. That's okay. So that's a Haywood case. Nothing to be concerned of at this point. When we compare the estimates, they are actually uh, not the same. Some of them are close to one another. For example, 0 0.86, 0 0.807, that's close. But 0 0.475, 0 0.29, that's not even close. 0 0.493, 0 0.641, not close. So we get different starting values give us different sets of estimates. And, and this is a big problem because it tells us that the solution that we got is actually sensitive to the choice of starting values. And the choice of starting values, there are algorithms for that, but it is uh, more or less arbitrary. And it's not guaranteed that we actually got a unique set of estimates if we get uh, two, mo two models, two solutions that fit equally well, but give us different solutions. The model fits nearly as well. So this, this third model is uh, Basically, it's a failure of optimization. So it, the optimizer found us a solution which it thinks is the best solution, but the original solution actually was a bit better. Of course, how do we know that uh, there exists a better solution than the one that we just got? We only, only know that because of trial and error. So, so why is this uh, happening? And importantly, in, in, the th in the third model that we estimated, there are no warnings. So if we just estimated the third model, we would have gotten different set of results than the first two models, slightly worse fit, and we would not know that there's actually a problem because there are no warnings. And the reason why this happens is that this model is nearly empirically non-identified. So we are very close to the condition of, of not being able to calculate the estimates because some of the covariances are, are the certain values that prevent us from estimation. And to understand the empirical under identification of this model, you need to understand the empirical under identification of bifactor models. So let's try simulating from a different set of starting uh, population values. So let's assume that all these uh, factor loadings are the same and we use the same psi matrix, matrix as before, all indicators are all interesting factors are correlated at 0.3, the method factor is uncorrelated, all variances are 1, and epsilon has variance of 1, we calculate sigma, the population covariance matrix the same way, we estimate from the population covariance matrix, we get an error. If we take a look at the actual estimates, we can see that incorrect estimates from the population matrix. So we had a full population matrix, and we, we know that from that population, the factors are correlated at 0.3 because that's how we, we created the data. But then uh, this happens. So we get incorrect results. 
This means that the estimates are inconsistent. If you can't get it right from the population, then your estimates are inconsistent. So, so why does this happen? And um, under which conditions would the model be not be identified? So the empirical identification problem here is basically that we have only three unique values in the population covariance matrices. We have 0 0.3, 2.0 and 3.0 and we are trying to estimate 30 different parameters from just uh, three unique values. That can be done. So uh, this is a big problem. Identification requires that the loadings are different. So if the loadings are the same, then the model is not empirically identified. If we estimate from a sample, this uh, shows us something uh, interesting about this problem. So we cannot estimate from a population and, and we, we will get a warning that the model is not identified. But what will happen when we estimate from the sample is actually something different. So I'm generating a set of normalities with random numbers using seed 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and uh, 200 observations. We estimate from that sample there are no warnings. Everything went fine. The model fits well. We get uh, estimates. We have standard errors. But the problem is that these estimates are not close to the correct values and the standard errors are large. So we had a, pop a model here that if we have the full population, we, we cannot know how much the factors are correlated. If we have a sample here from that full population, we get no warnings. So we have an inconsistent estimator because we can't get it right using the full population. But when we use a sample, there is no indication of this problem. And uh, you, can, you can think of how frequently would a researcher notice that there's actually a problem in the model for the population in the case that they would got completely fine looking uh, estimates that are nevertheless incorrect. Because you of course wouldn't know what the correct population values would be. So why is this uh, empirical identification of this model a big problem? It's a big problem because typically when we design survey instruments, design survey questions, we try to make all the questions about equally good. So we think we like to think that the items are interchangeable, so they are equally good. We, we try to go for tau equivalence, which is that they share the same true score. And that of course means that loadings are the same. So, so we try to, uh, if we do a, a really good, well, good scale development study, that should produce a scale that is empirically under identified using this model. So uh, in basically to, to get this model to work, you would have to design your scales in a way that some items are bad by design. And that doesn't sound like a reasonable approach. So nearly empirically under identified populations or empirically under identified populations are probably very common when using this kind of models. In sample data, the sampling variation can provide identification. But this is, this is the, uh, just the artificial identification. It doesn't really, really mean anything. You just get some random noise that allows you to estimate, but it doesn't allow you to say anything about the population values. Of course, if you can't using the population values, you can't say anything about the, the population correlations can, don't allow you to say anything about the population values. Then uh, by adding sampling error there, you shouldn't be able to say anything either. But nevertheless, the software gives you a result without warnings, but you just can't trust these results because it simply uh, happens to be identified because of sampling error in the data. You get no warnings and you get potentially misreading results. So this is a big problem. Also empirical under identified models do not always converge. And uh, this is the, the thing that the literature refers to as convergence problems of these models. So what do researchers actually do when their model does not converge? The typical thing to do is to fix the loadings to once for the method factor. But this is a <coughs> bit of a problem because uh, the identification problem is not whether we can, we can identify the relative magnitudes of the method factor loadings. The identification problem is, is more about that we cannot know if the items are correlated because of the method factor
or because they measure constructs that are correlated. So, so fixing the factor loadings to be the same, while it can accomplish identification, it also produces uh, a misspecified model and it addresses an incorrect problem. So fixing the pr problem, the loadings addresses an incorrect problem. It does not address the problem that you can't say if a high correlation is because of a method or because of highly correlated construct. Finally, there is not much research done on this issue. So I, I try to look for paper articles that talk about identification of these models and beyond ar finding articles that stated that there are identification problems without explaining what those are, I couldn't find any. So this is something that uh, someone probably should take a look at at some point. The bottom line is that the results from unmeasured method factors should probably not be trusted. There, even if you get a, a solution or a set of estimates without a warning, that does not guarantee that there is no empirical under identification in the population. If the population model is, un, is not identified, then you cannot say anything using the sample data regardless of what your software gives you. So these kind of models probably should be avoided. Now let's take a look at the, uh, the market variable model and this identification. This is a more defensible model. So this is the marker variable here and these are marker indicators and uh, the marker variable, marker construct or marker factor is constrained to be uncorrelated with the interesting factors. We can actually prove the identification of this model and it's a lot more doable because we have these, uh, these equations here are a lot simpler. So uh, one and seven are, indicators one and seven are only correlated because of the method. So we have 36 covariances, uh, we have uh, uh, 19 parameters, 17 degrees of freedom and uh, how, how we would actually go about proving the identification of this model would be that we, we first solve uh, Psi MM, so we solve the variance of the method factor that allows us to solve the method factor loadings and once we have solved the method factor loadings we can solve for the, uh, for the markers, we can solve the remainder of the method factor loadings and once we have fully solved the method factor then we can basically uh, take whatever sample, sample covariances remains after the method factor has been parceled out and estimate the, no, the factor model of the interesting factors from the residuals. And that allows us to solve the uh, full identification of the model. So if we can solve the variance of the method factor then we can basically uh, prove that this model is identified. So, I'm going to be first uh, looking at these equations here and I'm going to be uh, subtracting or substituting these to these equations here. So we just try to start eliminating equations. Now let's, let's focus on, on this set of equations here. These are the correlations between uh, the interesting indicators and the marker indicators. So uh, we eliminated the correlations Within, uh, between the, all the marker indicators and now we have just the interesting indicators and the marker correlations here. We got 15 equations and 5 unknowns. So we have the method factor loadings and 10 degrees of freedom. So we, we have our uh, over identification constraints. We can solve the fact method factor loadings here and then we, these remaining covariances give us over identification tests. So we can just uh, plug in the uh, lambda m2 here and that gives us a con constraint that should hold for the data and then we can check if that holds. All right, so we can uh, eliminate these constraints. We can substitute these equations on the left hand side and that gives us a bit more equations. Now we are trying to solve a uh, variance of the method factor from these remaining equations. I'm actually not going to do that because it gets a bit tedious but I'll explain the strategy how, how we would go about doing it. So uh, what we would actually do is to choose four equations and I'm going to be choosing sigma 1, 4, sigma 1, 5, sigma 2, 4 and sigma 2, 5. This is four sets of equations with four unknown. So we have uh, sigma AB, uh, lambda B1, lambda A2 and uh, lambda B2 and uh, sigma MM. So we have four unknowns there and four equations so we, we start solving. it. How we would do this is that we would first solve a uh, sigma AB as a function of uh, sigma MM, then we solve sigma uh, 
b5 as a function of sigma mm using uh, the solved sigma ab. Then we solve here sigma a2 as a function of sigma mm and then we, we plug in uh, the solutions to sigma a2, sigma ab and sigma uh, lambda b5 to uh, this equation that produces a third degree polynomial and those third degree polynomials generally have solutions and that establishes the identification. Actually working through the math, working through the third degree polynomial gets very tedious so we will not do that. So, so this is identified but is it empirically, under, empirically identified? So uh, what is the empirical under identification problem in this model? Well we face the same problem as before and uh, so let's take a look. Now we have as before we have factors that are loading equally but now the third is a marker it's uncorrelated with the first and second and we uh, generate population covariance matrix. We estimate the population covariance matrix to equal loadings. We get uh, this uh, warning that the model is not identified and we have only four unique values 1, 1 1.3, 2.0, 3.0 but we have 28 parameters so we can't really estimate. Identification again requires that loadings differ. So uh, what exactly is the identification problem? In the previous model with the unmeasured model the most important identification problem was that we did not know if for example x6 and x7 are correlated because of the method or because they measure construct B and construct C that are correlated. Now we know that x6 and x7 are correlated only because of the method. But we have to ask why do x6 and x7 correlate? And uh, this x6, x7 correlation is basically a product of these two loadings and the variance of the method factor. But we don't know whether it's uh, the method that affects more strongly to x6 or whether the method affects x7 more strongly. So we know that uh, overall the effect of method on x6 and x7 is something because we know the correlation but we don't know which one x6 or x7 is affecting more strongly. So here the identification problem is that we don't generally know if the method affects these x7, x8 and x9 variables more strongly or if it affects these variables more strongly. So what can we do when we face the under identification problem? When we fix the method factor loadings to ones here then we are actually solving the right problem because the, the problem was that as a set we don't know if there are x1 to x6 indicators load highly on the method factor or whether x7 to x9 load highly on the method factor. So we didn't know the relative uh, magnitudes of those sets of loadings. If we fix all variances to one, all, all loadings to ones, we address that identification problems. So identification problem is the effect of method factor or marker relative to the effect of main indicators is not known and therefore this fixing addresses the right problem. Again this is something that there is not much research done on this issue. So articles on these method factor models mention identification problems but they are rather vague about the identification problems. They don't go into the explaining in detail what exactly the problem is. The bottom line here is that these kind of models are defensible and if you suspect empirical under identification you can solve it to, by fixing all the indicator all the factor loadings to be ones for the method factor but probably a better solution would be to fix for example uh, two factors to be the same two loadings so we uh, fix for example the first loading of the uh, marker and the first loading of the first uh, interesting construct and then that allows uh, identification. So we don't have to fix them all. And which factor loadings you fix, you need to consider theory. So what do you, which uh, indicators you think are most strongly affected by the method variance and uh, which of the markers are most strongly affected and fix those. The bottom line is that uh, the, these can be useful but if you constrain loadings to be the same for identification purposes then you should clearly state that uh, you are making an assumption and this model is probably an approximation for of reality. Another strategy for addressing empirical under identification would be to uh, use such a large sample that empirical under identification is not 
uh, a concern or at least the person if you have a sample size of 10,000 then a person who says that your model is uh, empirically under identified and you can you only get results because of sampling error that argument wouldn't be very realistic. Let's take a look at another example. So this is uh, from uh, Spectre 2019 and they talk about the use of marker variables and they are uh, recommend that you should actually have more markers and this is a good idea. So uh, they are using mood and negative effects. So these are not really markers but they are directly measured uh, causes of method variance. So if you think that for example interpersonal conflict and physical symptom items are affected by different sources of method variance which they probably are because uh, I would as assume that people are less likely to say that they are, have interpersonal conflict because that's not socially desirable than to uh, complain that they have physical symptoms which doesn't have the same kind of social desirability bias. So uh, if you have multiple different measures that you can apply uh, as, as, as markers then that's always better because allows, it allows you to, uh, to match the kind of bias that you're assumed to have with a marker that you think is affected by the same source of bias. This model shown here would not be identified and I contacted the authors and they actually mentioned that these are mood and negative affect are directly measured variables. So, so they are scale scores instead of latent variables and using scale scores here would actually identify the model. So conclusions on, on the identification of method factor models. These models are problematic and uh, for generally the modeling approach is problematic because a single source of method variance is often unrealistic. So you would really have to explain if you use these models why you think that single source is, is the thing. So is it only social desirability that affects the items? That would be a stretch if you have a, for example behavioral items and evaluative items in the same survey. Empirical identification is another problem. The way to do with empirical identification is that uh, you have a very large sample size. If you get a result from that without warnings, then empirical identification is probably not a concern. So how should these models be used? I don't think that the unmeasured method factor should be used uh, unless your sample size is so large that, that you can rule out identification because of, of random noise. Even then it's a very risky strategy to rely on because uh, you may have empirical identifications. If you plan in advance on using this model with unmeasured method factor, it's possible that you get a data set that your population actually is empirical under identified, identified and you can't really do anything about it. Then you need to redo the study, recollect data with markers or measure sources of method variance to address the problem. Market variable ones are more defensible but you should really uh, not use just uh, a single method factor and then add markers to the model. But if possible you should be considering a more advanced model and then you should think through what are the sources of method variance instead of assuming that there's just one factor. This article by Spectre talks about uh, the choice of, uh, of different sources of method bias and how you can actually uh, think through your items and, and evaluate which sources are they affected by. And then this article by Simmering talks about the marker variable choice. Both are essential if you want to use markers. Then there's the issue of proper interpretation of these models that I talk about in another video.